You know, I'm not generally one to be overly dramatic about the capabilities of camera equipment. I mean, let's face it, they're all pretty good these days, aren't they? And what's that old saying we keep hearing that it's not about the camera gear, it's all about how you use it. Now, you know, I actually totally agree with that statement, except when it comes to shooting highly demanding low light photography and high ISA nightscape photography. Now, to be honest, a really good quality fast aperture lens coupled to a modern full frame camera will always give you a significant advantage over lesser equipment. You'll find that you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get rid of the noise and the aberrations which rear their ugly heads on average gear when nightscape shooting. But you know, today's topic is astro time lapse. And if you've ever tried it, you'll realize that there are many challenges that have to be faced to get outstanding results, especially if you're game enough to try day to night time lapse sequences. Every now and then, a piece of gear comes along that really sets a high standard with photography. And in this case, I'd like to share my experience with the Nikon Z6 Mark II camera, which I've been shooting now for about the past year and a half. Now, I wanna be clear with this. I'm mainly talking about astro time lapse in this video. And the points I'm making regarding this camera are heavily weighted towards that genre of photography. Okay, so I've been shooting astro time lapse, well, for many, many years. And as a Nikon shooter, I've used the older DSLR cameras before moving to the mirrorless Z6 variants. I actually got pretty good results with the DSLRs, as you can see here. But when shooting with those cameras, I'd always be very careful to avoid any auto modes for fear of introducing jitters into the footage. A bit like what you can see here when I attempted a day to night time lapse on my old D750 in aperture priority mode using the inbuilt intervalometer. Back then, if I wanted to do a day to night time lapse, I'd always employ some sort of external device to do the heavy lifting. Now, usually that would have been a time lapse plus view intervalometer. And this worked pretty well, but I used to often find it difficult to handle the connection issues and firmware updates that were required to keep it working properly. Not to mention the hassle of getting it to talk to other motion control equipment, which I started to introduce into my workflow. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a great device and actually works very well for a number of camera brands, but I actually haven't used it for a couple of years now. And the reason is the amazing inbuilt time-lapse features in this Z6 Mark II camera. And by the way, the original Z6 is also awesome for time-lapse, but it does lack uh, a couple of things that I really like in the Z6 Mark II, which I will elaborate on as we go through. So why is the Nikon Z6 Mark II so good for time-lapse? Okay, before I go there, I'd like to show you a collection of time-lapses shot with this camera, and you can see for yourself what I'm actually talking about.
I think the key to the excellent performance of these cameras is the exposure smoothing option built into the interval shooting menu. Now I often shoot in aperture priority mode with this camera when I want a day to night time lapse. And as mentioned, that's something I would never have done before. So I've used a variety of lenses for this as well. In fact, I purchased a Lauer 15mm f2 lens with the native Z mount just to shoot time lapses. And it's actually proved to be a pretty good lens. Now, that Lauer lens isn't the sharpest I've ever owned. And to be honest, it isn't a patch on the native Z mount lenses like this one. But for time lapse, it actually gets the job done quite well, especially when they're usually cropped to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Anyway, let's take a look at the interval timer shooting mode of this camera. And as you can see in the menu here, the first thing to think about is the interval. It's really important to understand that for this camera and many others for that matter, the interval is referring to the time from the beginning of one shutter actuation to the beginning of the next. So as you can see here, I have it set to 18 seconds. That means I'll be shooting a 15 second shutter speed with a gap of three seconds before the next image is taken. Now, initially this is very confusing for a lot of people, including me. But once you get your head around that setting, it becomes quite easy to work out all the timings and so forth for your shooting. What I do is stick to standard shutter speeds. For example, uh, eight seconds, 10 seconds, 13 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, etc. And from there, I make sure that there's about a three to five seconds of gap after that. Okay, so to be clear, if I want a 10 second shutter speed, I'll set the interval to maybe 13 to 15 seconds. If I want a 15 second shutter speed, then I'll set the interval to 18 or perhaps 20 seconds. You have to leave more time than the intended shutter speed for the camera to do the work required to capture the image, write to the card, and then get ready for the next one. Okay, so the next heading is intervals times shots slash interval. Now, I find this is a very confusing heading. All they really needed to say here is, how many shots do you want to take? It shouldn't be that hard. But look, hey, maybe the menu designers at Nikon have never actually used the product. Hey, I'm just saying. After that, we have the amazing exposure smoothing. Now, nothing needs to be said about this. Always leave that one on. It effectively smooths out the exposure changes across multiple frames and stops hard jumps in exposure that can introduce flicker into a final time lapse. Next up is silent photography, or sometimes called electronic shutter. This is a great feature for time lapse shooting, and I always try to leave this on. Um, uh, as well as that, it keeps my manual shutter count lower. But there are a few situations when you'll have to turn that off. Some external time lapse motion control equipment won't work with electronic shutter, so you have to disable that feature for those to work. Okay, now the next menu is interval priority. This is one that sometimes does my head in. And by that I mean I sometimes struggle to decide whether to leave it on or not. You see, it works like this. If I'm going to be shooting a day to night time lapse, I have to decide at the beginning, while it's still daylight, what my night settings need to be in order to get a decent exposure. To do this, I'll calculate my aperture, shutter speed and ISO, as we normally would. Now, the problem is that we can't take any test shots to make sure we're actually right with our calculations because it's still daylight. So what do we do? We take our best guess on the night settings and set our shutter speed and ISO to suit. And by the way, we will be using auto ISO if we're doing a day to night time lapse in aperture priority mode. That's how it works. Okay, so if we set our shutter speed as I showed in the interval section previously, and then we check this interval priority, the camera will stick to this and not exceed that shutter speed. 
Now, I don't want to confuse you, but when you're doing these time lapses, we have to understand that the shutter speed and the interval and the auto ISO settings all work together to get a correct exposure. If we uh, mess up any of these, then we actually run the risk of ruining our time lapse. And I've actually done this many times. Either I've forgotten to check the interval priority box or I've forgotten to enable the auto ISO or perhaps I've set the maximum ISO level too low. If I do that, no matter what happens, the camera will underexpose the image if it gets really dark at night. But if I uncheck the interval priority box, then the camera is actually given the green light to extend the shutter speed beyond the interval I previously set. So, for example, if I set the interval to 15 seconds, then I'm assuming the camera will shoot up to about 13 seconds shutter speed and put a two second interval between the shots. Now, it may be 10 seconds with a five second interval. It really doesn't matter as long as it adds up to the 15 seconds that I've set. Now, if the exposure required is for a longer interval than that 15 seconds, then the camera will override my 15 second interval and go all the way up to 30 seconds if that's what it thinks is necessary for a correct exposure. Now, while this actually works for the individual frames, the reality is that it, I think it rarely looks good on the final time lapse because the longer interval causes the sequence to speed up. And you'll notice this particularly with uh, passing clouds. And, and I find it very distracting. One way to stop this from going too far past your uh, initial interval setting is to allow a higher ISO ceiling in the auto ISO settings. So if you consider that you'll need uh, a 10 to 13 second shutter speed and perhaps a three to five second gap between each shot, and maybe an ISO of 3200 to get the correct exposure, then I'd set the maximum ISO to somewhere above that 3200 level just to build in a bit of a buffer so that our shutter speed and interval isn't extended too far. Now, <laughs> I fully realize this sounds very complicated and I'll admit it does take some time to get your head around it all. And I still make mistakes with these settings, especially when I'm in a hurry to get set up. But don't let that put you off. And I hasten to add, this is really only a problem when shooting day to night sequences, because if all you want to do is shoot a fully nighttime time lapse, then you can do some test shots to establish the correct shutter speed and ISO and simply set everything to manual and leave it there. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. Let's keep going down the menu. Next, we have focus before each shot. Now this is a no brainer, it's always off. We're using manual focus. After that, you can see the heading options. Now, this is one of the things I love about this camera. In here, you can set the camera to not only shoot raw files images, but to also shoot a 4K video file at the same time. Now, I absolutely love this feature. In fact, I often just use the 4K video file without any editing at all to show my time lapse. The video file is instantly available as soon as the sequence is finished and shows as a separate MP4 video file on your card. If for no other reason I set this feature on so that I can instantly preview the whole time-lapse sequence that I've just shot to make sure it worked as required. This is a huge time saver while out in the field and I love it. Okay, so there are a few other settings uh, related to storage folders and options, etc. but I'm not too worried about those at present. What I really want to show you is the amazing versatility of this camera for shooting fully automated day to night time lapses. I reckon the biggest and most annoying byproduct of any cameras when shooting time lapse set to aperture priority mode is flicker. And this can be really nasty and hard to get rid of. I'll be honest with you, flicker does not exist with this camera when you enable exposure smoothing. It's just so good. Now, another absolutely awesome feature of this camera is its ability to shoot fully automated day to night time lapses in program mode. Yeah, you heard that right, 
P mode. So in that mode, not only are we letting the camera decide the shutter speed and ISO, assuming we have auto ISO set, but we're also letting the camera decide the best aperture to use to get the correct exposure. Okay, now hang on. Surely that's taking it a bit too far. I mean, how does that work? Well, I'm actually glad you asked that question. I have to hand it to the engineers at Nikon. They've worked out a way to let the camera negotiate complex exposure changes in a well-organized and logical order. So it happens like this. Let's say you set your camera to P mode. It's still daylight, remember? Maybe you set the interval to 15 seconds and the ISO to auto. Your intention is to go from full sunlight to complete darkness over the course of a few hours. So you set your minimum ISO to 100, this is in your auto ISO settings, and your maximum to 6400. And from there, you set the number of shots to 600. All right, so bear with me. So that means that it will take 9,000 seconds of time to shoot. That's 600 times 15 equals 9,000. 9,000 divided by 60 equals 150 minutes. 150 minutes divided by 60 again equals two and a half hours shooting time. It's simple mathematics. Mind you, I'm not sure mathematics is ever simple. But remember, I've mentioned to you many, many times before, everything to do with photography is to do with mathematics and can be worked out using formulas. Now, okay, let's get back on track. I'm not talking about a city nightscape here. I'm talking about a really dark sky location, a long way from any major city lights. It'll get very dark eventually, and the camera has to work all of this out as the light changes. Remember, we're starting in daylight. So let's say the camera says that the aperture needs to be at f8 with a shutter speed of, let's say, 1 200th of a second at base ISO of 100. Remember, it's still broad daylight. And at this stage, and, and we're in P mode. That means the camera is choosing these parameters, and that's fine. We've already set our interval at 15 seconds, so that means the camera will take an image and begin a new one every 15 seconds, regardless of the shortness of the shutter speed during the daylight. But this is the brilliant part. As the light levels fall and the exposure changes, this Nikon Z6 Mark II camera has a built-in sequence to change the settings. It begins with the aperture, then the shutter speed, and finally the ISO. So let's assume we're using a lens with a maximum aperture of f2.8, like this one. As the light levels fall, the aperture will begin to drop from our starting point of f8 until it reaches f2.8. Then the shutter speed will begin to lengthen gradually until we reach our maximum shutter speed of somewhere around 13 seconds. And at this point, our ISO, which began at 100, will gradually increase until the camera is happy with the exposure. Now, if it's a really dark sky with no ambient light or moonlight, then this, this might be around, let's say, ISO 3200 or even higher. Now, this is why I recommend building a buffer into our maximum ISO in the auto ISO settings. If our camera gets to ISO 3200 and it still thinks the image is underexposed, it has no further options to adjust. Uh, we, we've already hit our maximum aperture. Our interval has been set at 15 seconds. And as long as we checked the interval priority box in our settings, it won't increase that. But if we let the camera go higher than ISO 3200, maybe as high as ISO 6400, then we probably will get a correct exposure. Now, I reiterate, we are shooting in a very dark sky location, away from light pollution on a moonless night. This is actually a situation I find myself in more often than not. When shooting a fully automated time-lapse sequence such as this, there will always be the, uh, the possibility that the parameters can change if the lighting conditions change. For example, if the moon rises, uh, then obviously the ambient light levels increase. Therefore, the camera will start to decrease the ISO and potentially the shutter speed. It won't change the aperture though. 
<laughs> I fully realize that's a lot to get your head around. So in a minute, I'm going to go through all the key information in dot points to help make it really clear. Uh, but first, I need to draw your attention to another little known feature that's built into these cameras to assist with our automated time lapses. So if you go to the menu labeled ISO sensitivity settings and turn on auto ISO sensitivity control, you'll see where you can set the uh, maximum sensitivity. Now I have mine set to 6400, but the feature I wanna draw your attention to is just underneath that labeled minimum shutter speed. And as you can see here, I have this set to 15 seconds. But what does this mean? It took me quite a while to figure this out, but it's a great feature. Essentially, it means that the ISO when set to auto when shooting in interval shooting for time lapse will not begin to increase until that minimum shutter speed is reached. So for example, if I had this number at eight seconds, the camera would begin to increase the ISO when the shutter speed got to eight seconds. Even though the shutter speed still has a fair way to go to reach my initial interval of 15 seconds, which I set back at the beginning. So the, the Nikon engineers in their wisdom have built in a method to make the camera increase the exposure in a way that uses the exposure triangle the way it was intended to be used. And that is adjust the aperture first, then the shutter speed, and lastly, if necessary, the ISO. And I find this to be absolutely brilliant and something I must say is not a feature in too many other camera manufacturers. Anyone who shoots low light nightscape photography will understand that we always wanna shoot at the lowest ISO as is necessary to get the shot. The last thing we want is for the camera to increase the ISO before the shutter speed, which is exactly what a lot of cameras will do in automated modes. Okay, now I know a lot of you will be shouting at your computer screens right now and telling me that as soon as you start adjusting aperture, you'll introduce a heap of flicker. Yes, of course, that's what used to happen all the time until I bought this camera. No, not anymore. It's as smooth as silk. And I often use that very feature with my day to night time lapses. Another thing I'm sure a lot of you will tell me is that by adjusting the aperture, then surely my focus will shift as it opens up. Well, it's certainly not a problem when using the native Z mount lenses. What I do is make sure I'm focused to infinity to start with, no matter what that aperture is. For example, I'll focus on a tree or a building maybe 10, 15 or 20 meters away, and it's still focused to infinity at all apertures. Now, I do hasten to add that this feature is certainly dependent on focal length, but I only shoot these types of time lapses with wide angle lenses from say 14 millimeters up to maybe 20 millimeters. It will never be an issue with those focal lengths. And to prove my point, you only need to check out a depth of field table to see if what I'm saying makes sense regarding finding infinity focus. One other thing that also helps here is the illusion of motion blur that exists in any video clip, including time lapses, and that helps to hide any slightly soft focus anyway. I've been shooting this way for years now, and I don't have any issues at all with focus shifting during the sequences. What I do often have issues with is lens fogging and batteries running out near the end of long time-lapse sequences, especially during very cold weather. Well, that brings me to another magnificent feature of the Nikon Z6 Mark II. You can power this thing easily all night via an external USB power source. I've found that just about any power bank will keep this thing alive. The only requirement is that you have a battery installed in the camera. The battery doesn't need to be full, but I usually do start with a full battery. So by having an external USB power source attached, it seems to keep the battery charged and therefore the camera just keeps going. And I reckon that's brilliant. The original Z6 camera doesn't have this feature, so keep that in mind. Now I fully realize a lot of other cameras do have this feature and look, some have probably had it for years as well. So that's a good thing. Regarding the lens fogging, 
I'll always attach a lens warmer to my cameras and when there is any possibility of moisture appearing on the lens. There's nothing more annoying than having fog appear on the lens and ruining an otherwise great time lapse. So as you can see here, there are many methods to power your equipment when out shooting in cold conditions for long periods of time. The biggest problem is making sure all the cables remain tidy. And this is especially important when shooting with motion control equipment that, that turns or slides the camera along a track during the time lapse. Uh, those cables can certainly become a trip hazard for any non-attentive time lapse photographer. Now recently I shot a very long automated day to night, then night to day time lapse spread over 13 hours. To make things a little more complicated, I also had the camera attached to my Zeppon pan and tilt rig, which enabled the camera to follow the Milky Way galactic core right across the night into the morning blue hour. This would not have been possible without the excellent features built right into this amazing camera for time lapse. So we've made it to the end, but before I do finish, I just want to recap the main features that I find most impressive with this camera for Astro time lapse. Firstly, the amazing exposure smoothing that works to eliminate flicker from regular time lapses, especially day to night ones. Secondly, the way that the camera can ramp the exposure in the order that I prefer, and that is aperture, then shutter speed, and lastly, ISO. If I'm doing an aperture priority time lapse, then it will only need to ramp the shutter speed and then the ISO. But it still does it in that order. Thirdly, the way that you can set the desired auto ISO settings to best match the time lapse outcome that we require. I love that. Fourthly, this camera has the amazing ability to produce a high quality 4K video file of the full time-lapse sequence, as well as all of the original RAW files, which can be edited later on. I find that the 4K video to be a great way to quickly preview the success or otherwise of my sequence. And in some cases, that file is all I will ever need. You can uh, call it a backup if you like, but it's a great feature to have built right in. And finally, I love that you can power the camera via an external USB power source. For time-lapse, I regard that as a must-have feature. So there you have it. For all the reasons I've mentioned, I reckon this camera is an absolute nightscape time-lapse beast. I honestly don't know of anything better out there at the moment. By the way, at some stage in the future, I'll make a video explaining how I set this camera up with my other motion control time-lapse equipment. Now I know I've touched on this before and this subject can be quite tricky, but when you get it right, the results can be simply amazing. These days I'm actually mostly using Zeppon equipment and I'm finding it a great alternative to much more expensive systems. 
All right, well, oh dear, oh dear. That's about it for today's video. I'll look forward to reading your comments and suggestions. I'm sure, that, sure there'll be plenty down below. So until I see you in the next video, you guys have a fantastic week. I'll see you soon.